Today, I'd like to tell you about some uh, of our, my lab's recent work on the PV pipeline pathway. These pathways, actually, in a way, is a polar form because you will see they have multiple functions. We well, initially discovered um, in my lab to be important for stem cell self-renewal, especially for stem cells in the germline and also for germline development. Subsequent work by my lab and many others have shown that this pathway is very important for suppressing transposons. Uh, today, I want to tell you two more, new, uh, more recent mechanisms we discovered that actually might help explain why uh, these molecules have the ability to maintain stem cells and to suppress transposons. So uh, I'll tell you two new mechanisms. One is when uh, these molecules are in the nucleus, they turn out to play a very important role in epigenetic regulation. And the second mechanism is that when they are in the cytoplasm, they actually play a very important role in regulating the expression of messenger RNAs and link RNAs. And if I have time, I will also tell you about these pathways' important functions in cancer. So as you all know, uh, the epigenetic regulation refers to the study of the heritable changes in our genome without changing DNA sequence information. And epigenetic regulation is achieved by a special group of proteins called <laughs> epigenetic factors that organize our DNA uh, into chromatins in terms of open versus closed conformation, which in turn dictates transcription. And because of epigenetic regulation, uh, as a zygote starts to divide and become a multicellular embryo, Many, uh, one genome now will become many epigenomes, which in turn defines the multitudes of cell fate. Today, the epigenetic study have been uh, mostly focused on discovering these epigenetic factors and how they modify the chromatin modification status to change chromatin configuration. Lots of exciting progress have been made at this level of epigenetic study. However, we know that most of the epigenetic factors we've discovered so far today actually do not bind to DNA, let alone have DNA sequence recognition ability. So therefore, to me, a central question in epigenetics is what's the mechanism in the nucleus that can guide these epigenetic factors to the right sites in the genome in right type of cells at right time? Uh, when we started this work, uh, f f a few epi epigenetic factors were shown to be guided by uh, a few transcriptional factors to the promoter sites of a very small number of genes. Let's start to explain the guidance. However, in a way, strictly speaking, that's a feedback loop. Then the larger question of how most of the epigenetic factors are guided to this specific loci in the genome still remain not known. Today, I hope to tell you that we actually have discovered a major mechanism uh, in the germline for this guidance. And this mechanism is related to the argonaut PV protein family that we discovered 20 years ago, actually, at Duke. So this uh, protein family is highly conserved during evolution. It contains four domains. The central PAZ and mid-domain together binds two small RNAs, whereas the C-terminal PV domain resembles RNASH. So as you all know, that the argonaut protein or gene family can be divided into two subfamilies. The argonaut subfamily is, central, is, is a central player in the RNAi and the microRNA pathways. So the argonaut subfamily proteins binds to either siRNAs or microRNAs, both of which are in general 21 nucleotide long. And these proteins are expressed in most types of cells we've uh, examined so far, and that's why RNAi and microRNA pathways work for most types of cells. Uh, for my lab, we actually been focused more on the PV subfamily because uh, as a developmental biologist or stem cell person, this, summary, uh, this subfamily was more attractive to me because PV subfamily proteins are expressed mostly in the germline and primitive stem cells. And about 10 years ago, my lab and independently three other labs discovered that this family of proteins bind to yet another class of small non-coding RNAs that we named PV-interacting RNAs, or PIRNAs for short. 
pioneers are somewhat longer than microRNAs and siRNAs. And they, as I said, are mostly expressed in the germline and other few types of primitive stem cells. Just to give you a quick review of the salient feature of pioneers in contrast to microRNAs. In addition to their length difference, pioneers are much more complex than microRNAs. So uh, today, my lab, we've discovered over 16 million different species of pioneers, which is more than 500 times more than the total number of known genes in our genome, in contrast to microRNAs, which are about uh, in the order of 1,000. Also, pioneers correspond to all type of genomic sequences, which again, in sharp contrast to microRNAs, which mostly correspond to 3 prime UTR or mature RNAs only. Also, the biogenesis of pioneers is very different. It's mostly uh, made from single-stranded long RNA precursors that are encoded in the intergenic region versus microRNAs, which are encoded by their hairpin precursor structures. So this is really, uh, we are very excited about this finding because as you know, the molecule biology in the past several decades has been focused on the study of the central dogma. And the discovery of the microRNA and siRNA pathways illustrated to us that now there are two new mechanisms involved in this dogma, namely involved in the regulation of either the stability or the translation of messenger RNAs. However, as you know, central dogma is only a few percent of our genome, and the vast majority of genome, which I prefer to call terra incognita, to now is where most of the pioneers are encoded. So we are very excited about this finding, and this was a pie I baked from my lab to celebrate the discovery of pioneers. It doesn't taste very good, but it does have a special meaning. So this uh, discovery was also uh, rated by the Science Magazine as uh, one of the 10 breakthroughs of the year. And celebrations aside, the key question is, does any of these pioneers have any functions, or they're simply the RNA equivalent of genetic junks? To address the question, I'd like to start a, a brief review of uh, my lab's uh, earlier work to lead to the latest discovery. So soon after we discovered the pioneer in mice, we discovered that pioneers also existed in uh, Drosophila. So shown here is the Drosophila genome with X chromosome telomere here, centromere there, and the left and right arm of the second chromosomes here, and the left and right arm of the third chromosome here, and there's a tiny fourth chromosome. As you can see, if you map pioneers to the genome with the sense strand on the top and the antisense in the back, you see pioneers map to all types of sequences in the genome. Especially they're enriched in the pericentric heterochromatin. They are also enriched in the telomeric sequences. And of course, they're present in many euchromatic sequences. In order to study the function of pioneers, we decided to focus on a particular pioneer that uniquely came from the subtelomeric region of the chromosome 3 right arm. And we named this pioneer for ease of uh, um, communication. TAS pioneer means telomere associated sequence pioneer. So telomere associated sequence is another name for subtelomere sequence, which is also highly conserved between flies and humans. So because this pioneer uniquely maps to this region, so its biogenesis has to be coming from here. And if it has any function, it may target back to this region. And also because this pioneer is in the nucleus and binds to the Drosophila peewee protein, which is a founding member of the Argonaut gene family, we decided to study the function of this pioneer in possible epigenetic regulation because it's a nuclear presence. And peewee was also present in the nucleus, and by then we knew PV genetically behave like an epigenetic factor. So the question is, does PV pioneer complex bind to that task chromosome? When we did the chromosome immunoprecipitation experiment using anti-PV antibody, you can see that only the genomic sequence that are complementary to that particular pioneer is significantly enriched actually over 500 times over the background. If you look into the sequence, 
flanking uh, the type target sequence, just 200 base pairs this way or that way, that's just one nuclear song away, it goes to the background level. So that gives us a first hint that this particular PV pion a complex actually binds to the chromatin. So the question now becomes, does this binding of PV to the task chromatin uh, cause any epigenetic or chromatin effect to the binding site? When we looked into the uh, transcription or chromatin marks for the binding site, as you can see, this so-called typical uh, subtelomeric heterochromatin not only contain uh, abundant heterochromatic marks, such as HP1 means uh, heterochromatin protein 1, or the methylated form, so H3K9. It also contains euchromatic marks, such as the acetylated form, so H3K4, and the methylated, uh, K9 and methylated form of H3K4. So when we remove the PV, to our surprise, the euchromatic marks are just decreased, whereas the heterochromatic marks are visibly increased. So this analysis told us that the binding of the particular PV pion complex to the target site actually enhances its euchromatic feature. Later on, when we did the genome-wide analysis, we found that uh, PV actually binds to many sites of genome, and about 10% of the binding sites will have such euchromatic enhancing effect, whereas 90% of other binding sites cause heterochromatic, uh, heterochromatic effect. So now the question becomes, what proteins does PV interact to achieve such epigenetic regulation? When we did the uh, uh, East 2 hybrid screen and later on we did the proteomic screen, we identified a number of very interesting factors. Today I just want to focus on one of such factors, which is called the HP1, heterochromatin protein 1A, as I briefly mentioned in my last slide. So as you know, this protein is a key epigenetic factor that's conserved from yeast to humans and is broadly implicated in epigenetic function, especially in heterochromatin-mediated silencing and in maintaining chromatin structure and for ensuring chromatin segregation. And this HP1A protein is composed of two functional domains. The N-terminal chroma domain is capable of binding to the methylated form of H3K9, and that's why H3K9 is a mark of heterochromatin whereas the C-terminal chromo shadow domain is known to interact with other proteins through the binding of the PXVXL motif on the surface of other proteins. So uh, through a yeast hybrid screen and later on through structural analysis, we showed that the HP1 molecule indeed interacts with PV. Shown here is an MRI uh, image of the HP1 molecule with only the C-terminal chromo shadow domain shown here. As you can see, uh, this protein actually formed a dimer which created a symmetric interface. These fingers then hook the PV protein, which I'm only showing the interacting residues here. Indeed, they interact with a motif, a PXVXL motif, with valine at the 30th position of the PV uh, protein, obviously at the end terminus. So, We've shown that this valine is extremely important for the interaction. If you mutate the valine residue, the interaction will be abolished. So then we wanted to know, is the HP1 PV interaction important for epigenetic regulation? To address the question, we did a series of genetic and biochemical experiments to show indeed that's the case. And here I just want to show you a very simple genetic experiment. So this is a fly. If you mutate the PV gene, because of the essential function not only in the gene line, but also important function in soma, the PV now flies are mostly lethal. Now, if you introduce into this null mutant a wild type copy of PV transgene, then you can completely rescue the lethality. Now, if you mutate the valine residue at the 30th position, that's important for PV HP1 interaction, now this transgene will fail to rescue the viability. This experiment and others told us that not only PV and HP1 by themselves are important for epigenetic regulation, their interaction is essential for epigenetic regulation. We then wanted to know at the genome-wide how much this impact on the genome. So when we did the 
H3K9 methylation mapping uh, genome-wide, you found out many regions of the methylation actually is PV dependent. For example, this is the left arm of the second chromosome. You can see many regions, especially in these boxed regions. Now, when you remove the PV protein, the methylation will be decreased to the background level. So our several years of study allowed us to propose this model for explaining how PV pioneers can guide epigenetic factors to their sites in the genome. We propose that PV and pioneer form a complex, which will then bind to the corresponding sequences in the genome. And very often, in fact, in mostly almost euchromatin regions or euchromatic regions, this binding actually is through the interaction of PV pioneer with the tethered nascent transcript. And this binding then leads to the recruitment of HP1 to the site. And HP1 will then further recruit histone methyl transferase and potentially other epigenetic factors to the sites. This recruitment of HP1 initiates epigenetic programming. And this further recruitment uh, further elaborates epigenetic programming by methylate H3K9, which leads to more HP1 binding and so on. So the current Pathway started from here, the methylation start with histone methyl transferase. But we are very happy we are able to explain how and um, somehow HPR methylation will be recruited to the specific target site. Now, if this model is right, one can imagine that if you can insert a pioneer complementary sequence ectopically to a site, for example, here that originally does not bind to PV one should be able to see recruitment of PV to that site. Now, if you mutate this ectopic site, because if model predicts pioneer binding is the key, then you should expect to see now we abolish the binding. And we generated almost 20 different lines of lights to test this hypothesis. Shown here are just two of these uh, many lines. Uh, in this first line, we duplicate a pioneer target sequence in trans onto a different chromosome. On the second line, we duplicate the pioneer target sequence in cis, but onto uh, the different arm of the same chromosome. And line three is a control for this line. We mutated the ectopic pioneer target sequence. And as you can see, the ectopic site, without inserting the pioneer complementary sequence, had no PV binding by this chromatin uh, chip experiment. Now, when you insert the PV sequence, it indeed leads to the recruitment of PV to the site. And this happens either you insert the PV in trans onto a different chromosome or in cis onto the same chromosome. Now, if you mutate the target site, now you completely abolish the PV binding to the ectopic site. So this tells us that actually the pi-RNA molecule is both necessary and sufficient to recruit PV molecules to a specific genomic site. Now the question becomes, is it capable now to recruit epigenetic factors to the ectopic site correspondingly? And that turned out is the case. Using HP1 as an example, now this ectopic recruitment of PV leads to the ectopic recruitment of HP1 molecules. So we've been illustrating and we feel very comfortable by focusing on specific locus like this that PV pioneer complex can recruit epigenetic factors to their target sites. And I've shown you that PV mutant causes uh, methylation changes or H3K9 and other epigenetic changes in many chromosome sites. So the next question becomes, are PV directly interacting on these sites to cause these changes? Or some of those changes are indirect effect? Basically, it's really a question of now seeing the whole forest see what happens. So we first uh, did the cytological experiment uh, using immunofluorescent staining to stand for PV protein and chromatin. Shown here is a Josafla protein chromatin, which contains about 1,000 copies of DNA. It's a beautiful graphic representation of the Josafla genome. As you can see, PV standing green here actually directly binds to many different sites, including that uh, subtelomeric sequence initially we showed to have PV binding. Now, if this is the case, one should be able to do so-called chip-seek 
to really reveal this binding site at the nucleotide level. Unfortunately, that has not been the case here because my lab and subsequently several other major labs have been trying to do chip seek on PV, but all failed. And the reason is because chip seek normally rely on the stable binding of a protein sta steadily onto a particular site. So when you do chip, you see a beautiful peak. Now it comes to the situation of PVE pi-RNA binding to the genome is very different. First of all, it's mediated by pi-RNA and nascent RNAs. Therefore, these preps are very much subject to RNA degradation. Secondly, because the nascent transcript is keep moving within the transcription unit, so even though PVE bind in theory corresponds to this side, but its tethering side kept moving. So that actually will spread the signal to be very weak. And lastly, when the nascent RNA is off from the chromatin, it will still bind to this and compete with the PV binding to chromatin. Because of these problems, we decided to use a different mechanism to map PV binding to the genome, named the DAM-ID method. So DAM is an E. coli uh, you know, DNA methylase, as you know, it methylates the A residue at NAGATC sequence in the genome. So we reasoned if we hook up them to PV, then you should enrich the methylation sites near the PV binding site that will allow us to map PV. And that indeed is the case. So the reason we use this method because it's a kiss and run mechanism. It doesn't require stable binding or uh, even uh, strong binding. And also another important reason is Drosophila actually doesn't have dam-like activity. So it's a blind slate for this methylase. So we first showed that if you hook up dam just by itself, you should uh, see randomized methylation in the genome. That indeed was the case. And then we showed this, if you hook up dam with a polycon group, genes component polycon itself, it now should enrich the methylation site to the polycon binding site. That was also indeed the case. After doing this experiment, we know that this experiment can work in flies. So then we did the DAM ID for PV binding. This uh, polycon without obviously DAM methylation has no methylation activity in the genome. Now if you fuse DAM to PV, we expect to see methylation along the PV binding site and in this negative control, you should expect to see no methylation. And uh, here, indeed, is a case, as you can see, if you use them ID to map a PV binding site, it maps to many sites of the genome. So we believe this is a major mechanism of epigenetic guidance in the Josaphila genome. Now the key question becomes, is this something peculiar only to Josaphila or this epigenetic guidance mechanism also exists in mammals. Uh, in, to address that question, we focused on one of the three PV proteins in the mouse uh, called the MIWI2. So MIWI2 is a nuclear PV protein, just like PV protein in flies. There are three PV proteins in flies. Two are in the cytoplasm, and one is in the nucleus, the PV itself. In mice, MIWI2 is one of the three PV proteins which is also present in the nucleus. We wanted to know if MIV2 has an impact on the epigenetic landscape of the genome. So when we uh, focused on few reported genes, such as this one, RAS GRF1, we know that this gene normally is heavily methylated. And this is the real data showing its methylation status. Now, if you knock out the MIV2 protein, you see the methylation of this locus it just had decreased. And this is the real data here to almost background level. So this analysis allows us to show somehow that MIV2 indeed is required for the DNA methylation of this locus. And as I show you, many other loci. Now, because MIV2 is part of the pioneer pathway, we wondered if this, again, just like in flies, it reflects the involvement of the pioneer pathway in this process. So we created another mouse in which we knock out the pioneer generating locus. What we have noticed is that within this target gene, there is pioneer target sequence. Uh, let's don't worry about the name, that green sequence. And that green sequence corresponding pioneer is produced by another uh, green sequence 
from another chromatin. So if we knock out that sequence in the chromosome, only that specific pion is no longer made. Now even though if you restore the MIMV2 to wild type level, you should expect to see failure in methylation, and that was indeed the case. One can also show that even if you let that pion be produced, but if you delete its target sequence here, then you should also lead to the failure in methylation, and that also was indeed the case. So this analysis allowed us that the MIMV and that particular set of pion together actually is important for the DNA methylation of this locus. Now we further wanted to test whether this methylation mediated by MIWI is also through the interaction with nascent RNA. If so, if you can just simply mutate the promoter of this target locus so that the transcript will no longer be made, one should also expect to see failure in methylation, and that indeed is the case. So all these analysis allowed us to conclude that the PV pyRNA by binding to the nascent RNA or the target locus actually is required for the DNA methylation of the target locus. We've also done uh, this uh, biochemical analysis to purify MIV2 pyRNA complex. It turned out indeed it not only contained that particular green pyRNA, but also contains the nascent RNA complementary to it. So this analysis allowed us that in the mammalian system, the PV pyRNA's function in guiding epigenetic factors to many sites in the genome is indeed conserved. And we now know that we, uh, this mechanism is responsible for at least guiding to more than 8,000 sites in the genome, which represents a, a very large part of the genome. To summarize uh, the mammalian function of the PV pyRNA pathway, uh, we now know that uh, the pyRNAs are made as a long precursor transcript including that pyRNA will be towards the target site. And these pyRNA precursors will be actually processed by MIMV2 itself into many mature pyRNAs, including that target site targeting green pyRNA. And this pyRNA MIMV complex then will target the nascent transcript in the region, which will then recruit some kind of DNA methylase, which then further leads to the methylation of the locus. So in my lab, we are now actively searching for such DNA methylase that are interacting, or is, or, or more than one, that are interacting with the target. So as you can see, the PV pyrene target mechanism is well conserved uh, in the mammalian system. And the only difference is that uh, there, the known function now we've discovered is DNA methylation versus in fly, histone methylation. In fly, DNA methylation is essentially uh, not functionally important. So we believe because this lack of DNA methylation, histone methylation becomes the basal level methylation for flies. But more importantly, in organisms with DNA methylation as a direct form of uh, epigenetic regulation, this mechanism probably starts to play at the level of DNA methylation. So uh, this is really the first part of my talk, the main point I want to illustrate namely the PV pyrene pathway actually is a major mechanism that guide many epigenetic factors to the target site in the genome. Yeah, so obviously this will then lead to all the, you know, biological functions we know earlier, stem cell cell renewal and germline development as illustrated by my lab and transposon silencing as illustrated by many labs. So far I've told you about when PV molecules and pyrenes are in the nucleus, that's one of the major functions. Then how about when these proteins are in the cytoplasm? Amazingly, they have another function that's completely unexpected as well. So as we know, our genome contains 23,000 genes. In addition, we have vast intergenic regions in which about a million copies of transposons reside. And 96% of these transposons in the human genome are retrotransposons. transposons they transpose by making these intermediate RNAs. Transposons are today still generally viewed as the selfish parasites that invaded our genome. We cannot uh, get rid of them, just have to cope with them. There are a few studies talked about transposons functioning in mutagenesis and potentially transcriptional regulation, but the genome-wide function of transposons largely remain unknown. Now, because of uh, many labs working, including that of mine, we know this intergenic region also contains 
new types of genes which encodes uh, non-coding RNAs. So these non-coding RNA encoding genes were code for many link RNAs and millions of pi RNAs. And finally, we should not forget that in our genome, we also have the abundant existence of pseudogenes. In the human genome, we have 14,000 uh, 14, pseudogenes. Most of the pseudogenes are still expressed and made into messenger RNAs, or sometimes from the antisense promoter into antisense RNAs. However, nothing is known about the function of these pseudogenes. They are, in general, regarded as the defunct carcass of their active genes on their way out during evolution. Of course, very little is known about the functional or regulatory relationship among these major constituents in the genome. Today, I hope to illustrate to you that transposons actually play a very important role in regulating the expression of protein coding genes at the post-transcriptional level. In addition, I'll show you that many pseudogenes also play a very important role in regulating the expression of their sister sibling genes. Furthermore, I'll illustrate to you that transposons also play a very important role in regulating the expression of many link RNAs. And finally, as you might have guessed, I hope to demonstrate to you that all these regulations are mediated by the PV pioneer pathway. So to study uh, these mechanisms, we actually have been focusing on spermatogenesis in mice. Mouse spermatogenesis, again, is a stem cell-driven process started by the robust self-renewing divisions of a small number of germline stem cells in the testes that leads to the production of many spermatogonia, which will then enter meiosis and eventually become round haploid spermatids, which will then undergo drastic cellular morphogenesis and become multi-mature sperm. In the mouse genome, as I mentioned earlier, there are three PV proteins. MeV2, the nuclear PV protein, is mostly expressed in the stem cell region. And the second protein we named MeV, means MeV-like, is expressed mostly in the stem cell and progenitor cell region, but also enters meiosis. The third uh, PV protein called MeV, means mouse PV, is most expressed during meiosis. Now, corresponding to the expression of these three PV proteins in the mouse genome, there are two major populations of pioneers expressed during spermatogenesis. The first population, called the spermatogonial pioneers, they are mostly expressed in the germline stem cell region. And the second population, called the packeting pioneers, they are mostly expressed during meiosis. Because packeting stage is a very long phase of prophase final meiosis, so we name this packeting pioneers. When people first discovered the spermatogonial pioneers, uh, they and us found that most of these pioneers correspond to transposons. That's why there was a huge number of papers published in high-profile journals showing that PV proteins and pioneers, their main function is to suppress transposition. However, when we first discovered the packeting pioneers, we found that actually only less than 40% of these pioneers correspond to transposons. So then the question becomes, what's the function of these non-transposon pioneers? To address this question, we decided to use MeV mutant because we knew that MeV is critical for the biogenesis of these pioneers. In the MeV mutant, most of the packaging pioneers are gone. So we can find out in the absence of these pioneers, what's the defect? And the defect is very obvious because the spermatogenic cells will be blocked at the exit of meiosis which is a very important uh, process. In order to study the molecular mechanism, we wanted to see, you know, MeV proteins, are they in the nucleus or in the cytoplasm? Where are they expressed during spermatogenesis? Turn out they are expressed in early meiotic cells in the cytoplasm. This is a, a 14 DPP mouse seminiferous tubule which contains germline stem cells here and the meiotic cells. You can see MeV protein colored in red here is only present in the cytoplasm of these early meiotic cells. That led us to a simple-mindedly reason. If MeV has any gene regulation function, the function must be post-transcriptional and in the cytoplasm. So we sorted these MeV expressing cells from MeV mutant mice and heterozygous siblings this transcriptome analysis, and to our surprise, we found that hundreds of messenger RNAs, each is represented by a circle here, 
is significantly upregulated in the MeV mutant meiotic cells. This immediately told us that somehow MeV is required normally to suppress the overexpression of these messenger RNAs. Because again, MeV is involved in the pioneer pathway. pathway. We wondered if this is a pioneer dependent process. If so, if we can knock out another gene that's important for the biogenesis of these pioneers, for example, a gene called the MOF 10 l one you should be able to see similar changes in the transcriptome profile. So when we transcriptome profiled these meiotic cells from the MOF 10 l one mutant, it gave us almost identical shifts of these RNAs. So these analyses allowed us to conclude that actually the MeV pioneer mediated pathway is important normally to suppress the overexpression of these messenger RNAs during meiosis. We then wanted to know where are these messenger RNA, you know, where in this messenger RNA are the pioneer targets. And when we did the, the transcriptome bioinformatic analysis, uh, as we expected, we see only those messenger RNAs, which are largely upregulated in the MeV mutant, which contain abundant pioneer target sites. So this analysis together allow us to tentatively conclude that the MeV regulation of messenger RNAs is guided by pioneers. So the next question becomes, what kind of pioneers are there to regulate these messenger RNAs? When we looked into these pioneer sequences here, to our surprise, they are extra transposon sequences. We thought we know our genome so well, and especially our transcriptome. We never thought actually our transcriptome in our mature messenger RNAs, there are transposon sequences. So this analysis allowed us to conclude that MeV regulation of messenger RNAs is guided by the transposon pioneers. Then the question immediately becomes, where are the transposon sequences hiding in these pioneer targeted messenger RNAs? When we did the transcriptome sequence analysis, we found out that uh, for those messenger RNAs, I need to explain this chart a bit. Here is a five-point UTR meta map of the entire transcriptome. Here's a protein coding region. Here's a three-point UTR. For those messenger RNAs, which are largely upregulated in the MeV mutant, they contain abundant transposon sequences. And for those who are not upregulated, they do not contain RNA sequences. And as you can see, these transposon sequences are somehow mostly in the three-point UTR, so they will not disrupt the coding capacity of the target RNAs. So then what are these transposon sequences? Turn out more than 50% are signed elements, and there is also a fair share of other major classes of transposons. So because of the identification of the transposon sequences, we immediately thought uh, these sequences might be mediating the degradation of the messenger RNAs by the pioneer. RNA. To really examine this possibility, we focused on specific genes. Shown here is one example, and this gene is called the TDRD1. Itself is a very important gene, important gene in the non-coding RNA pathway. So this is the mRNA of TDRD1 with tiny five prime UTR here, protein coding region here, and three prime UTR there. Indeed, in its three prime UTR, there are two transposon sequences. In this case, two subtypes of assigned elements. When we did the deep sequencing to see whether in the MeV heterozygous situation there will be any sign of cleavage at the target sites, and we see in all three triplicates, indeed, there's a sharp cleavage. So you can see right at the site of this particular transposon, you see a sharp cliff, cleave the RNA level to only about 50% of the wild type level. So this told us that the MeV protein is important for the cleavage of this RNA, why the cleavage is not complete, it could be either due to the MeV cleavage is dose sensitive, also possibly another mechanism might be needed for the complete cleavage. But in any case, this chart clearly told us that the MeV protein uh, is required for the cleavage of this messenger RNA right at the target site in the 3 prime UTR. Now, if that's the case, if you can mutate just one or two residues in the MeV molecule that's required, for the catalytic activity of this molecule, which we did, now you can completely seal back the cliff 
the iron is no longer cleaved. So this analysis told us that actually MIUI and very likely media by its pi on A because only this side is complementary to pi on A that is responsible for the cleavage of these messenger RNAs to prevent the overexpression. Now in the genome-wide, if you find out all these uh, target sites in all the target RNAs that are cleaved by MIUI and pi on A, line them up according to the pi on A sequence, you can see such a chart. So this is a pi on A. All the pi on A's are compiled here when they can target messenger RNA. And you can see when you line them up from the five prime end, there's a bit of a sequence heterogeneity, as we know that pi on A's in mice mostly ranges from 28 nucleotides to 32. However, if you match them to the messenger RNA sequence, no matter how long the pi on A is, it's always the 10th nucleotide away from the five prime end that have a sharp cleavage. So this analysis allowed us to conclude that the MIUI pi RNA complex can directly bind to the target messenger RNAs, which then leads to the cleavage of the uh, target messenger RNA at the tenth position away from the five prime end of pi RNA, which leads to the prevention of the overexpression. Now, if this model is correct, one can imagine that even if you build a competing artificial gene, for example, this artificial gene is driven by a promoter that's expressed during meiosis, will be expressing M. cherry, and it's three prime UTR, we can insert a sign element. Either the B1 subtype or B2 subtype. And we can also create it another mouse strand which will be expressing this messenger RNA completely at the same level in the same type of cells, but now you can use a Cre line to flux away the sign element. Now you can ask, two questions. One is that we're inserting a sign element here, reduce the expression of M-cherry RNA here. And will this reduction be dependent on mean we function? So here is the result. You see this mouse uh, strand expressing this RNA containing sign element. This mouse strand expresses this RNA without sign element, but exactly at the same level in the same type of cells. The expression of this RNA is indicated in blue and this one in red. As you can see, the pre-RNA's expression level is statistically identical, showing that the uh, insertion of this uh, sign element does not impact on the transcription of these pre-RNA's. However, when you look into the mature RNA's, when you remove the sign element, these messenger RNAs become significantly overexpressed. And this overexpression indeed is MIUI dependent because now if you introduce this transgene, even though it still contains a transposable element now into the MIUI mutant, you still see significant upregulated overexpression. And we've now done experiment to delete transposal sequence in several endogenous uh, MIUI target genes, and it all caused very similar effect. So this analysis allowed us to show that uh, transposons through the pioneer pathway actually can regulate the expression of messenger RNAs. However, during our analysis, we found out some of the messenger RNAs which are upregulated actually do not contain transposon sequences. <clears throat> then the question becomes, what kind of uh, pi RNAs are involved in regulating those messenger RNAs? Again, showing you one example here. This is a stem BP gene with five prime UTR here, the protein coding sequence here, and there's a long three prime UTR here. We indeed found corresponding pi RNAs that can, <coughs> excuse me, target this messenger RNA. However, these pi RNAs are no longer localized in the three prime UTR. More importantly, none of these pi RNAs correspond to any transposon sequences, but rather they look almost identical to the target gene itself, except for that they are antisense transcribed with occasional polymorphism. That led us to think that there must be a pseudogene of this gene in the genome which are responsible for producing these pi RNAs. When we searched the genome, we indeed discovered such a gene. We named the pseudo uh, stem BP pseudo sequence. So now you have a pseudogene correspond to a real gene. We can do a wild experiment. Namely, we can knock out the pseudogene and see if this pattern is disappearing and whether the corresponding active genes expression will be correspondingly changed. 
And so what we did is we knock out this pseudo stem BP sequence. And indeed, the pioneer generated from this locus are now reduced to background level. And then surprisingly, and somewhat in a way expectedly, the active gene, that's sister gene to the pseudo gene, now become overexpressed by 16 fold, become almost cytotoxic. And this expression, again, is at the post-transcriptional level, because when you look into the precursor RNA of this stem BP gene, the expression abundance or level is not changed. So this type of analysis allowed us to conclude that the, some pseudogenes can also, through the pioneer pathway, regulate the expression of the real genes. And encouraged by these discoveries, then we looked into another major classes of RNAs, link RNAs in the genome, see if their expression is in any way subject to the regulation of the pioneer pathway. And that indeed is the case. So this is, these are the link RNAs cloned from my lab. You, as, as you can see, all major tissues have link RNAs, and particularly in the testes, there's abundant presence of many types of link RNAs, and particularly within the testes, in meiotic cells, there's uh, meiotic-specific link RNAs, which are more than 6,000 species. And if you zoom up this region, you can see these link RNAs are only expressed in early meiotic cells. Now, when we looked into MIWI mutant, to see if any of these link RNA expressions are changed. Uh, likewise, many of these link RNAs, more than 1,500 different species of link RNAs are drastically overexpressed, which represents more than 25% of the total link RNAs that we discovered in this type of cells. When we looked into these link RNAs, indeed, they contain transposon sequences. So this analysis allowed, to, allowed us to further conclude that Transposon sequences can also mediate the stability of many link RNAs through the pioneer pathway. To summarize what I told you so far, the second part of my talk, you know, when we think about gene expression, we commonly think about the central dogma. DNA is transcribed into pre-messenger RNAs, which are then capped and tailed and spliced, and to make mature RNAs, then got exported in the cytoplasm. But I want to um, you to pay attention to other activities in the cell, namely at least in germ cells and many types of somatic cells, transposons are also active, although transcribed at a low level. These transposon-derived RNAs will be processed into pi-RNAs, which then will, through the PV proteins, target those messenger RNAs which contain corresponding transposon sequences to regulate their expression. Furthermore, many pseudogenes are also, also expressed. And these pseudogenes will also feed into the pioneer pathway to regulate the expression of the active sister genes. Likewise, this is also the case for linker RNAs. The expression of transposons also play a very important role in regulating link RNAs in addition to the conventional transcriptional and post-transcriptional controls. So to further summarize uh, this part of my talk, uh, especially for graduate students, if you liken our genome of the Earth, then traditionally we have been focusing, focusing on the old world. There are about 23,000 traditional genes. And even in the old world, we often forget the presence and function of pseudogenes and transposons. Several years ago, my lab's work and that of others allowed us to land it ashore of a completely new world with pi-RNAs and link RNAs and now other kinds of RNAs. Today, I hope to have illustrated to you that these two worlds are tightly linked. I've shown you that pi-RNAs can regulate the expression of traditional genes. In addition, pi-RNAs can also regulate the expression of link RNAs. And the transposons can even regulate the expression of traditional genes. And even pseudogenes can regulate the expression of their traditional genes. Well, I'll quickly tell you the third part, I'll make this part very short, but I'm very excited about it, and I know many of my friends here work on cancers, so I have to talk about this. You know, so far, everything sounds very esoteric, it's a very basic science thing, but are any of these uh, discoveries or findings have any relevance uh, in the medical situation? We asked whether these guys have implication in cancer, because when we first discovered the PV argonal proteins, we found that these proteins are important for stem cell, cell renewal. And when we did the Drosophila work, 
uh, we found out this PV function is dose dependent. So shown here is the Drosophila ovarian tip, a region called Gemarium, where there are two German stem cells here. Each contains a spectrosome that we discovered early on, which marks a symmetry stem cell division, and these are stem cell specific organelles. Now, if you overexpress PV in Drosophila in this region, you leads to a huge increase in the spectrosome containing cells, which are stand like cells, because each one of them can undergo asymmetric division, eventually leads to Drosophila ovarian tumor. So, encouraged by that analysis, uh, we looked into the mammalian system. Of course, you know, not everyone would believe that. I would imagine if Champ had known this result, he would say something like that. You think you can learn from flies about humans, sad. But we decided to move ahead. And this is the earliest experiment we did. We looked into human testicular seminomas and see what happens to the human PUE that we named the HIWI, HIWI overexpression. Um, shown here is the in situ immunostanding of HIWI expression, which is indicated in blue. In Satoli tumor, which is a somatic tumor, you see no change in HIWI overexpression. In fact, in regular kind of a germline or mixed tumors, you don't see detected HIWI expression. However, if you look into seminomas, which is the major type of testicular cancer, representing 50% of all testicular cancers, and is known to be caused by the malignant proliferation of germline stem cells, and you can see that seminoma has very high level of correlation to the expression of HIWI. And in fact, this is the first gene to be correlated with this type of cancer. So we put this result aside because the pioneer field later on became very competitive. But in the past few years, we decided we really need to revisit this issue. Uh, we took a bold step, not only focus on the germline system, but also in the somatic system. We looked then into in the breast cancer situation, uh, see whether there's any correlation like that. So here are the typical, as many of you know, five human breast cancer lines. They are all mostly triple negative. This is a normal human breast cancer epithelial line, a uh, breast epithelial line. You see there's very little HIVI expression. If you do the standings only in the ductal pre-stem cell region. Now, if you look into these cancer lines, you see significant atopical or overexpression of uh, PV proteins. And I'm focusing, in this case, one of the four human PV proteins called human PVL4, which is the most abundantly expressed PV in these cancers. So this gives us initial cue that the overexpression of PV protein in this cancer might be like those overexpression in flies or in testicular seminoma situation um, correlated or possibly cause cancer. Then we sampled the 20 human patients, uh, breast cancer patients randomly, and with this sampling, 10 out of 20 breast cancer patients show significant overexpression of PV. And further encouraged by that, we actually went to the NCI, NCI database and screened for more than 1,000 uh, cancer patients. Just dividing these patients' expression level PV4 by upper 50% versus lower 50%. And even with that, we show a significant worsened prognosis for cancer patients with higher PV expression. So definitely, there's a correlation. Then the question becomes, so does this correlation mean the active role of PV4 in the breast cancer? It turned out that's the case. And if you take a breast cancer cell, for example, this is a triple negative uh, MB231 cancer cell, it shows a very robust proliferation with very few cells that are undergoing cell death. But if you just knock down PV4 alone, you significantly increase the number of cells that are undergoing cell death. And these cells, proliferation slow downs a lot. Most um, importantly, knocking down of PV4 appear to block the metastatic, at least migratory ability of these cancer cells. So this is a very typical simple wound healing assay. You remove these uh, aggressive breast cancer cells in this region, just within 36 hours, they will come back to heal the wound. Now, if you just need to knock down the expression of PV4, Within 36 hours, there's not much moving of these cells. We've also done transwell assay and the xenographing assay to show that these cells in the knockdown situation, and especially in the knockout situation, completely lost the metastatic ability. So then we wondered, where does PV function in the cell to cause 
such a drastic change of these cancer cells. It could be at the base of, you know, multi-molecule level or could be at cell fate level. It turned out it's at cell fate level. So here is a control triple negative breast cancer cells, again, MB231. These cells are highly mesenchymalized. It no longer express epithelial markers such as uh, E cadherin, but strongly express mesenchymal markers such as N cadherin. But you just need to knock down PVL4. This is three independent knockdowns with three different RNAi. You can actually switch the cell fate of these mesenchymalized cells back to epithelial fate. And so that allowed us to realize that, well, this must be acting very upstream. Then it turned out, indeed, it is acting upstream to regulate the known oncogenic pathways, especially the TGF and FGF beta pathways. As you can see, if you normalize the expression of these pathway components in the triple negative breast cancer cells as one, now when you knock down PVL4, the expressions are all reduced. What we didn't expect is that actually the expression of MHC2 complexes become drastically increased in the PV knockdown cancer cells. So our current model is that the PVL4 somehow can promote the expression of these oncogenic pathways to promote cell survival proliferation and EMT. Meanwhile, it will actually suppress the expression of MHC2 complex to suppress the host surveillance against these cancer cells. So encouraged by this initial result, we went wild. We decided to look into all major type of cancer cells, see what happens. And here's our latest preliminary results. You can see, in addition to breast cancers, we found this is the case in gastric cancers. This is the case in seminoma, as we found out earlier. This is the case in prostate cancers, in skin cancers, uh, in many type of liver cancers, and even in colorectal cancers. That's another cancer that's been focused on in my lab. So I really believe that PV pi represents a new oncogenic pathway, and my dream is really to use these molecules to screen for drugs for these cancer lines for the precision treatment of uh, cancer cells by blocking PV activity. And this approach has a very low threshold requirement, a big window, because the entire pathway normal is not, normal is not needed, I assume, in the human bodies. Because in mice, we've knocked out the entire PV family <coughs> proteins or genes, and mice still can survive nicely, except for the male mice uh, lose uh, fertility because PV is still required in the adult males. But that's not an issue because you can store the sperm of the patient before the treatment and also come to a decision of life versus death versus having a child or not. I think the choice is pretty clear. So I'd like to uh, acknowledge my people who did a great job. A former student and postdoc in the lab uh, did the epigenetic study and uh, the PV pi-RNA sufficiency study in recruiting a topic site was done by Xiao, another student. And Niels, another current postdoc, Na, a bioinformatics, was responsible for doing the MID experiment. Toshi uh, is responsible, a postdoc in the lab, for all the experiments I told you today in the mammalian system. And I'd like to thank a collaborator early on, uh, Michael Schneider, for some of the deep sequencing and uh, and Xiao for confirming some of the bioinformatic analysis we did. And I have a very energetic lab at Yale. As you can see, they're easily excitable. And uh, now I also started a second lab in Shanghai, mostly work on the cancer side, different from the uh, Yale's projects. Thank you very much.